Um, welcome to the Menachem Begin Heritage Center. My name is Paul Gross. Uh, I'm a senior fellow here and I, uh, I'm basically responsible primarily for the uh, English uh, content of the center, the English events that we do here. Um, if you are not on our mailing list and would like to be and would like to receive emails specifically about um, the English events that we have both here at the center and on Zoom, then drop me an email, Paul G at begincenter.org.il. Um, okay, um, Paul, Paul G at begincenter.org.il. The acoustics here mean I can hear whispers in the room. You're, you're warned. Um, all right, um, it's my great pleasure to, um, to welcome you to this, uh, to this event. Um, I became aware of uh, the book that we're gonna be hearing about uh, several months ago. And I very quickly um, got in touch, uh, found a way to get in touch with the author because I thought it's exactly the sort of thing that we want to be um, exploring uh, in our program, in our English language program here, where we're discussing both in the various events we do, both contemporary Israeli uh, issues, uh, political and other, um, and also Israeli and Zionist history. Um, and this is both a history book um, and a book which I think has um, great import and pertinence for um, contemporary Israel and the uh, Israeli Arab or Jewish Arab conflict writ large. Um, so um, I'm going to introduce our, our speaker. Before I do that, I want to say afterwards, he'll be signing, si signing and selling books outside. So um, please uh, stay around for that. For those of you watching on Zoom, you unfortunately can't take part in that. But um, my colleague uh, Lily has entered into the chat the link to um, to purchase it on Amazon, um, so you can you can of course do that. Um, okay, just wait. For people to take their seats. Great. Okay, so uh, Aaron Kessler is a journalist and a political analyst based in Tel Aviv. He served as deputy director for research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington. He's been a Middle East research fellow at the Henry Jackson Society in London. Arab Affairs Correspondent for the Jerusalem Post, as an editor and translator at Haaretz English Edition. He was raised in Rochester, New York, and Tel Aviv. He has a BA in History from the University of Toronto and an MA in Diplomacy and Conflict Studies from Reichman University, formerly IDC Herzliya. Uh, you can read his work in uh, such esteemed uh, outlets as Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and Politico. And the book we're gonna be discussing this evening, Palestine 1936, is his first book. And welcome, Aaron Kessler, to join me. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to have a conversation for for some time, and then open the floor for Q and A, um, both um, from the floor here, and also those watching on Zoom can write questions into the. Uh, into the chat or the Q&A, and uh, um, my colleague will, will put some of those to us as well. Okay, so um, let's let's set the scene for the book. Um, so my guess is that some people here will be more familiar than others of the history, and that's fine, we're gonna be discussing all of that. So we're talking about 1936. We have at this point the Jewish community in the land of Israel, the British mandate, Palestine, which is growing with every immigration ship that arrives from Europe. I think it's about 300,000 at this point, um, about 30% of the population. Uh, there's an Arab community here, of course, that's incredibly antagonistic to the Zionist enterprise, um, having been sporadically violent over the previous sort of 15 years or so. And the British authorities, who are no longer as committed um, to the Zionist cause as they were when the Balfour Declaration was, was uh, announced in 1917. And crucially, we also have the backdrop of Europe where Nazi Germany is growing in power and in menace. Um, and there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a, a sense that something, um, something pretty bad is brewing there. So my first question to you, um, as a fundamental question, I guess, is what, what are we talking about in 1936? What happened in 1936 to spark off this Arab revolt, this great revolt, which, which from what we're gonna hear is such a seminal point in, in Israeli and Zionist history. Because we have, um, if we think back to the, the two intifadas, you have the first intifada, which was, I mean, there were various things building, but there was there was a spark, right? There was the traffic accident in Gaza, 
1987, 1957, um, and, and then you have this kind of spontaneous uprising. And the second intifada, which was very different because you had, you, you had sort of, in, it was incited from above, Arafat was involved. So how, what's, what's the spark for this, for this event? Well, uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, thank you to the Begin Center. Thank you all for, for coming out. Uh, I, I need to start with a bit of an apology, a preemptive apology, because I'm just coming off of a nasty virus. So if I blow my nose or clear my throat or sound a bit nasal, that's, that's why. Um, the, you mentioned, Paul, the, um, the rise of Hitler and other anti-Semitic uh, movements in Europe. And this is really uh, a key a key element in what, in the backdrop to the revolt. You've got Jewish immigration in the first half of the 1930s, Jewish immigration, the Jewish population of this land doubles, right? So uh, Hitler comes to power in January, 1933. There are anti-Semitic movements and governments on the rise in Poland, Hungary, uh, Romania. And so uh, by 1935, 36, the Jewish population is nearing 30% of the population. Uh, of a total population of about, about a million. So as Paul mentioned, about 300,000 people. Uh, and the Arabs can't help but notice. The, uh, the Arabs are not just the uh, educated intelligentsia of the cities, but even subsistence farmers notice that the, the face of the country is uh, changing. And that if things go on this way, that there will be a Jewish majority before long. So that's kind of the immediate backdrop to uh, the revolt, should I continue? Yeah, can you hold uh, yeah, yeah. Zoom close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's the camera, by the way, is that? Yeah. Hi, everybody, at home. Um, and there's, uh, in late 1935, there's a man who's, uh, whose name will be known to many of you. It's Is Adin al Qassam. Qassam, of course, has lent his name to Hamas's armed wing, to the Hamas homemade uh, rockets that fired in Israel. And Qassam was a jihadi preacher originally from Syria and he was uh, he fled Syria because he was a wanted man by the French mandate authorities up there uh, and he came down to Haifa in the early 1920s and he was preaching at a mosque a mosque that still exists it's called Istiqlal Mosque in Haifa um, you can go check it out you can pray if you if you happen to be uh, with very Muslims in this audience uh, and he's preaching jihad in this mosque. He's preaching to, his, to the urban Muslim poor of Haifa. He's preaching things like, you know, when the British officer presents his shoe for you to, his boot for you to shine, don't take out your the brush from the, the shine box, take out a pistol, that sort of thing. And his followers wage some sporadic attacks against British targets and against Jews. And at a certain point, they kill a Jewish member of the Palestine police by the name of Moshe Rosenfeld. And now he's a wanted man because he's killed uh, a member of uh, His Majesty's police force. And, um, and long story short, a manhunt ensues. He's killed in the forest of what is now the Northern West Bank. And he kind of becomes the first real sort of martyr uh, in the Palestinian Arab pantheon, kind of the proto martyr of the jihadi uh, preacher warrior. And, uh, and Ben Gurion, who even at this time, at this point, is the, uh, is the leader, the basically recognized leader of the mainstream uh, Jewish community in this country, the Yishuv, as we say in Hebrew, uh, Ben Gurion, the head of the Jewish agency, recognizes the significance of this event immediately. And he writes in his diary, finally, the Arabs have seen a man who's willing to die for an idea or an ideal. And he predicted that there would be hundreds, perhaps thousands more like him. And then just a few months later, indeed, a few of Qassam's acolytes uh, ambush some Jews on the roads near Nablus to Karim area. Sort of sounds like uh, it could be a bit from the headlines today. Uh, but they're, 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 there's a car carrying three Jews, uh, who, uh, including an elderly poultry uh, merchant from Salonika who's buying chickens from the Arab uh, poultry for farmers around the Nablus area. And they're ambushed, they're killed. And that's in many ways the, uh, these are the opening shots of the great. Arab revolt. So that's just a bit of uh, historical uh, table setting leading up to the revolt. Okay, and the one of the main um, theses of your book is that this isn't just 
um, important because of the immediate consequences of, the, of the, the casualties on both sides, or I should say three sides, because British, Jewish, Arab. Um, but also that it's a it's something of it's a hinge moment. Something about this changes things for both the Jews and the Arabs. Can you say more about that? Sure. So uh, this the revolt begins in in violence, as I as I mentioned. There's also something called the Bloody Day in Jaffa, in which 16 Jews are are killed in multiple attacks just a few days after the ambush that I mentioned earlier. And it's clear to everyone. Uh, Jew, Jew, Arab, and Britain alike, that this is a new phase in, in the conflict. Um, and so just a few days after this uh, bloody day in Jaffa, uh, there's another man who will be known to probably most or even all of you, and it's Haj Amin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti. And uh, the, the, <laughs> the Grand Mufti, Haj Amin is, um, of course, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. He is head of the Supreme Muslim Council. Uh, but once these acts of violence begin, uh, he rushes to mm -hmm. assert control over this revolt. And we saw similar things in the Intifadas more, more recently, uh, uh, where the PLO sort of rushed to, to claim ownership over something that had begun at the grassroots. And so he declares, the Mufti declares something called the uh, Arab Higher Committee, of which naturally he is the head, and they announced that there will be a boycott of the uh, British economy and the Jewish economy until their demands are met. Three demands specifically, namely a complete uh, cessation of Jewish immigration, a ban on land sales because uh, very many wealthy, prominent Arab landowners were selling land to Jews quite happily at inflated prices, even as they railed against the practice in public. And then the third uh, demand was setting up a, a legislative assembly a kind of uh, legislature that would reflect the demographics of the land, which was still about 70% Arab. And so this strike begins and it lasts for six months. And this is really a source of tremendous pride for the Arabs. This is even to this day, one of the longest general strikes in history. And it bears fruit because the British send over a royal commission acting in the name of the king. In this case, the very short-lived King Edward VIII, who uh, famously abdicates to marry an American divorcee. Uh, but so the commission comes over here, they spend uh, several months here, they interview dozens of Jews and Brits, uh, the Mufti boycotts the proceedings until the 11th hour, and then he, he also uh, testifies and a few more Arabs testify. And they go back to London and they write their report and uh, they come up with this 400 page report. And if anyone has the entire month of July, I strongly recommend uh, they read it because it's a, it's, a it's a great read. Uh, but it's mostly remembered by history for its last 10 or 12 pages in which they, the commissioners recommend a two-state solution, if you like, a partition plan between the river and the sea, including an Arab state and a Jewish state. And this is really the first time that the words Jewish state appear on the international agenda in any real way, not a Jewish national home, as promised by the Balfour Declaration, but a state with everything that, that means. So these, these are just, so this is one of the major ways, and there are several more, in which, as you mentioned, Paul, this is a hinge moment. This is an extremely formative period. This is the birth of uh, the two-state paradigm, if you like, which has now become the template, becomes the template for every subsequent partition plan from the UN's exactly 10 years later uh, to those of, of our present day. Uh, and this is really when the, the whole notion of the Jewish state uh, appears on the agenda of the great power with the most control over this country, namely uh, the British Empire in this period. And the um, what's the implications of this for, for the Jews? Because, or for, and for the Zionist aspirations, because this is the time, as I said at the beginning, where the Zionist movement is attempting to bring over Jews from Europe and the Arabs and the Arabs are desperate to stop them. And the British will go on, of course, to, to implement their own uh, white paper, which will prevent, um, which will prevent um, or aim to prevent um, immigration, Jewish immigration. Does the, what are the, how does the revolt affect um, British policy and apart from the partition, like longer term, and and the and the 
um, let's say, the, the, the plans of the of the Zionist leadership, the Zionist movement, in, in particularly with regard to immigration. So there's a, a raucous uh, debate in Zionist circles among the Zionist leadership about whether to accept this partition plan. And the, uh, the revisionist, more right-wing uh, Zionist movement of Vladimir Zhabotinsky, which also included, of course, Beitar, and of which, of which uh, our very own Menachem Begin was, of course, uh, one of the leaders in, in Poland. There he is. Um, so Jabotinsky's movement, or Jabotinsky himself, rejected the partition plan out of hand. He thought the, it was a betrayal. He was still uh, demanding both banks of, of the Jordan as initially, uh, as, as the Palestine mandate was initially drawn before the eastern half was, was locked off in 1921. Uh, and so he rejected out of hand. Within the kind of quote unquote mainstream labor Zionist uh, leadership, there's it's there, it's not complete. Um, it's not. I think there's an idea now that that, that the mainstream leadership accepted it, and the Jabotinsky uh, the uh, Jabotinsky uh, revisionist movement was against partition. It was not remotely that simple. There were people in Ben Gurion's movement, high level people. Who were completely against it, thought it was also a betrayal. I believe um, Spector Menken was completely against the plan, for example, and he was very much on the left. Uh, and but the pe two people who mattered most uh, within the Jewish agency are, of course, David Ben Gurion and uh, Chaim Weizmann, the head of the World Zionist Organization, who really is the in this really until 1947, from 1917 to 1947-48. I write in the book that he's the face and the muscle of. Zionism in the world. Ben Gurion is barely known outside of this land. It's Weizmann who is the face of Zionism. And they both kind of play coy, but really, I've read uh, the diaries of both and the correspondence of both, and both of them are ecstatic by this proposition. They don't, this proposal. They don't think it'll be the last word in terms of territory. They think it'll be a foothold and they think it'll be a sanctuary for the persecuted Jews in Europe. This is already mid 1937 when this report is released. Uh, and so they, they prevail upon the, uh, the, the the Jewish agency and and, and uh, other leaders of the Zionist movement to accept with reservations this partition plan. Uh, unsurprisingly, the Mufti rejects it out of hand. He calls it a degradation and a humiliation and an amputation. And the commissioners are already back in London. And then, long story, relatively short. Uh, there's a man by the name of Lewis Andrews, who's the uh, acting commissioner of Galley. He's an Australian. He's a really fascinating character. Uh, he's a Christian Zionist. He's, he speaks very good Arabic, but also very good Hebrew, which was very rare among <coughs> British administrators. And uh, this Mr. Andrews is assassinated on his 41st birthday while attending church in Nazareth. Um, I have a special sympathy for him because I just turned 41 last month. Uh, so this poor, late, lamented Mr. Andrews is killed. And this is far and away the highest level British official to be killed during the revolt and indeed during the entire mandate. And now the gloves start to come off uh, among, among the British. And they're determined to finally quell this revolt. And the British realize, the British know, in fact, almost everyone in this country knows that it's ultimately uh, the Mufti who's pulling the strings of this revolt. That was the conclusion that British intelligence had reached. That's the conclusion that the fledgling uh, Zionist intelligence had reached. And it was essentially common knowledge among the Arabs as well. So the Mufti is now a wanted man. He uh, takes refuge at the Temple Mount uh, in Al-Aqsa, believing correctly that the British won't dare seek him there. And then he flees to Jaffa port dressed as a Bedouin. Some people say dressed as a woman, but I happen to believe he's dressed as a Bedouin. And then he, he takes a, a boat to, to Beirut and he doesn't come back for another four decades. Uh, but even from exile, he's kind of pulling the strings of this uh, revolt. And um, so one, uh, and so, so again, the British are determined to finally quell this revolt, but they have a problem. The war clouds are gathering over Europe. It seems to be a question of when and not if a war with Hitler is going to erupt. And they simply don't have the manpower to put down this revolt. So what do they do? They accede to a long-standing Jewish demand to arm and train the Jews in large numbers. And this is probably the second major lasting legacy uh, of this revolt and, and all of its repercussions for the Jewish-Israeli side. This is the period in which the Haganah goes, well, let me back up for a moment. 
there are something like 15 or 20,000 Jews who join something called the Jewish supernumer supernumerary police. In Hebrew, they were known as Notrim. And uh, they are armed and trained by the Palestine police, that is, by the British. But it's clear to everyone that they're ultimately answerable to the Haganah, namely the, the largest uh, Jewish self-defense uh, armed force at this time, which is still technically illegal, but tolerated by the British as long as they kind of behave themselves. Uh, and so this is really when the Haganah goes from a network of a very loose network of glorified uh, night watchmen to the seeds of a Jewish army, the seeds of the IDF. This is also the period, and I'll, 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 I'll end uh, this very long-winded answer with this. This is also the period of Ord Wingate, the famous Ord Wingate, speaking of uh, Christian Zionists. He was a very eccentric human being. Uh, he was extremely committed to the Zionist ideal. Uh, but most important, he was a military genius. And he began something called the Special Night Squads, which were mixed Jewish British units that operated at night and took the fight directly to the enemy. This is the first time Jews had been included in anything like remotely like this. Uh, and this this and the, the, this unit included men like Moshe Dayan and Yigal Alon. And this is really the, uh, the 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 seed of the future. This is the first Jewish special forces unit, if you like, and really the seed of the future IDF uh, leadership cadre. Okay. Um, so, to think about it. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> no, it's, it's all good stuff. So um, we have the, the the revolt goes on until 1939, by which time there's significant casualties, especially on the Arab side. And I'll ask you about that. But um, as well as answering that question, why why was it so dis why were the casualties so disproportionately on the Arab side? You have the the British white paper which restricts Jewish immigration. And yet, as you said, the Jews come out of the revolt strengthened because of this, the training that went on, this, the, the, the military training. And so by the time um, we get to crunch time a decade later and the war of independence, um, the, 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 Arabs are, the Arabs are somehow weaker somehow, the Jews are stronger. And I know it's a very interesting, one of the interesting theses in the book is that you, 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 your claim is that the, the Arab revolt has an imp very important consequences for the, the victory, effectively, of the, of the Jews in 1948. And the seeds of that victory were sown in the Arab revolt. So can you tell us something about that? And also, as I said, about the casualties. Sure. So the, um, so the British have, have made this partition proposal. Um, as, as mentioned, Ben Gurion and company have accepted it. The Mufti has not. Uh, the revolt is raging more fiercely than ever at this point. And the British engage in very heavy handed, some might even say brutal, counter insurgency measures. We're talking home demolitions. This is when home demolitions begin on any significant scale. 2,000 homes are demolished during this revolt. Um, uh, collective punishment was simply part of the game. If a, if a bomb was laid on uh, the highway, the British troops would, the British commander would come in, take out the, the Mukhtar of the nearest village, the, the village headman, say, okay, who did it? And if he couldn't tell him, then they would just start uh, demolishing homes. Um, curfews, checkpoints, um, you know, there's a, a, there's a wall built on the northern border with Lebanon because the Mufti is sending down militants and money from Lebanon. So there's a clear parallel there with the security barrier we have now on the West Bank. Really, the um, many of the most controversial methods of the IDF today really have their origin, both in terms of the, the methods themselves and even the legal basis thereof, because, in, because Israel inherited so much, so much uh, of its legal code and, and indeed its sort of army practices from the British. Um, uh, and um, administrative detention, namely detention without any specific charges. This all hails from emergency measures, emergency regulations in this period. So, um, yeah, so basically, so through these very heavy handed measures and through a lot of Arab infighting, really, and this is another sort of preview of the intifadas, particularly the second intifada, this revolt is, is sort of uh, put on the ropes. And much of this infighting is led, not all of it, but much of it is led 
by the Mufti in exile. He's still able to exert his will and to, uh, to uh, make sure that his henchmen uh, keep everybody back in Palestine in line. Uh, but really there's a convulsion of, particularly in the second phase of this revolt, there's a convulsion of uh, intra-Arab uh, violence. And there are, some, there are about 500 Jews who are killed in this revolt. These are really huge numbers. These are numbers we wouldn't see until the second intifada. <laughs> and this is a period in which, the, as mentioned, the, the Jewish population of the country is just about 300,000. Uh, so these are huge numbers, and about half that many British servicemen are killed, about 250. But about five to 8,000 Arabs are killed. So I write in the book that the, the and, and a certain proportion of those are, are casualties of these very, very heavy-handed British measures that I mentioned. The British hang 100 Arabs throughout this revolt, for example. Uh, but probably many more were victims of their fellow Arabs. And so I write in the book that uh, the revolt to crush Zionism really ends up crushing the Arabs themselves. And Paul, you mentioned um, that the Jews came out stronger in many ways. Ben-Gurion uh, and, and other Zionist leaders were, but particularly Ben-Gurion, was an expert at turning uh, adversity into advantage. And he really, he, I mean, I've, I've, I've read, I don't know how many pages of Ben-Gurion's diary, and he had a mind like a calculator. He would just, you know, his, his prepared remarks barely differed from his, from impromptu, uh, remarks and just the way that he thought. He said, okay, I'll if we can do this, then bet, and then bet, subclause one. And, uh, and he really, um, he, there, were the, there were the military gains that I talked about earlier on the Jewish side, but also economically. And Gurion saw the Arab revolt as a, a tremendous point of leverage to, uh, to, to realize a long-standing goal that he had had, a decades-long goal, of creating a self-sufficient Jewish economy that could feed itself, defend itself, house itself, <laughs> Uh, employ itself without any help from the British or from uh, the Arabs. This is the period, for example, in which Tel Aviv port opens because Jaffa port, uh, the, the workers at Jaffa port are striking. And so uh, the Jews petition the British to open their own port uh, in Tel Aviv, which they do in May 36. And uh, the Zionist leaders are ecstatic, but Gordon raves about it as a second Balfour Declaration. You know, finally, the Jews have, a, have an outlet to the world. Um, so the revolt is very much on the ropes at this point, as I mentioned, but this is already getting into 38, 39, and the British are determined to put it down finally and completely. And so with their endless insatiable appetite for committees and commissions and conferences, uh, they call something called the St. James's, they call the Jews and the Arabs to St. James's Palace, uh, just down the road from Buckingham Palace, am I right? And, uh, uh, and they um, and they call the Jews, they call the, the Arabs of Palestine, for the first time they call the Arabs of the surrounding countries. So it's a real milestone in the kind of regionalization of the conflict. Uh, but the conclusion of this, con of this conference is uh, foregone. They already know what the goal is. And this is, of course, the era of appeasement. This is the Neville Chamberlain government. Neville Chamberlain is prime minister during most of my book. And the word appeasement was not only used by people like Winston Churchill, who uh, was a fierce critic of appeasement uh, and, a, and a devoted Zionist for most of his life as well. Uh, this was essentially government policy and not just vis-a-vis -vis, uh, fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. I've read the cabinet papers and they, they, they talk fairly openly about appeasing Arab and Muslim opinion. And I've gotten a lot of questions in my book talks saying, okay, was this about Arab oil or, and, um, not so much. I think that's a, that's a little bit of projecting back into the past, but it was really about the Arabs, the, the Arabs. The British were particularly concerned about the Muslims of India, the large Muslims, Muslim population of India. And they were worried that if and when war broke out with Hitler, uh, the Muslims of India, which of course in these days includes Pakistan and Bangladesh with their very large Muslim populations, they were worried that if these uh, Muslims were not on board, they would cause real problems for the war effort. So they talk in these cabinet meetings about appeasing, quote unquote, uh, Arab and Muslim opinion as much as possible. And the result of this is so my roundabout way of getting to the white paper that you mentioned, the 1939 white paper, the famous or infamous white paper. Uh, it's known as the McDonald white paper because it was passed by a colonial secretary about 36 years old by the name of Malcolm McDonald who was the son of Ramsey McDonald, the first labor prime minister. And um, essentially it limited, it basically closed, not completely, but 
closed very narrowly the gates to this country. And this is to Jewish immigration. And again, this is mid-1939. This is May, June, 1939, critical time. And uh, if in 1935, 60,000 Jews came to this land, the white paper stipulated that a grand total of 75,000 could come over five years, exactly. After which any further Jewish immigration would be contingent on Arab consent. And it was clear, clear to all three sides that that consent would not be forthcoming. So, um, so this was seen as a tremendous betrayal, of course, by the Jews and their, and their supporters, um, and a tremendous victory for the Arabs. And yet even, uh, you know, the Mufti was famously uh, incapable of accepting yes for an answer. And the Mufti actually rejected the white paper. Uh, he went against all Arab advice. There were celebrations in the streets of Arab cities in, in Palestine, but the Mufti in his exile uh, rejected it for not going far enough, uh, for not having, for not including a complete stoppage of immigration, for example. The real reason was that it, the Brits wouldn't allow him to come back to Palestine as a victorious conquering hero. So he, uh, so that's why he was, in my belief, that's why he was opposed to it. But so the white paper is passed, and um, just a few months later, um, the war breaks out. And and I'll I'll just I'll just wrap up this answer with a a, little, a scene from the book. There's um, there's they have these Zionist congresses every two years, and I found kind of the minutes there, there was a Zionist congress in uh, Geneva in August 1939, and um, Chaim Weizmann writes about and so Jewish delegates delegates came from all over the Jewish world, and Chaim Weizmann writes about feeling as if they're being enclosed by two walls. On one side, the white paper, on the other, Hitler and the encroaching uh, war, um, or the, the fears of war. And while they're at this conference, this is late August, they, the delegates find out about the Hitler-Stalin non-aggression pact, which essentially removed the one major obstacle to Nazi aggression in Eastern Europe with its massive Jewish population. And just shock and awe take over the entire uh, conference, and they move to, to wrap the conference up very quickly. They stand up, they, they sing Hatikva. Uh, there are many of them have tears in their eyes. And of course, many, most even of those delegates were never seen again because a week later the war begins, and we know how, how that ended. So it's, I think, from a, a Jewish Israeli perspective, this would be the third really major legacy uh, of the revolt. Um, this white paper and it, it raises this tremendous what if of what might have happened had uh, the Peel partition plan of 1937 gone through, had the Jews had a state, however minuscule, back in 37, and had what would have happened had this white paper not been passed. Uh, David Ben Gurion said uh, in later years that it had they had a state, six million could have been saved. I'm not sure that's necessarily true. I'm not sure this country, this land could absorb 6 million people. I don't think most people recognize the enormity of what was to come. Uh, but I think it was Golda Meir, there she is, who, who said that hundreds of thousands could have been saved. And I think that's a, probably a plausible uh, reading of, of history. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, um, Kassam, who this uh, jihadist uh, preacher, um, and of course, um, Hajjimina Hussein was also the Grand Mufti. So I'm interested in the role, and maybe this is also me sort of reading back, thinking about the current state of, of Israeli-Arab relations, and, and, and particularly the, the direction from which the most anti-Israel um, uh, stuff is coming from, which is the, the sort of Islamist direction, the religious Islamic direction. How, to what, what role did religion play back then? I think I'm right in saying that it was primarily Arab Muslims, not Arab Christians, who were involved in, in the violence. Um, so it, firstly, is that true? And secondly, to what extent is, was religion, specifically the, the type of um, political Islam that we think of today, that we associate today with groups like Hamas and, and, and others, um, how, how, how influential was that at the time? Uh, so I also I realized I forgot to answer uh, one one part of your question, which is the the way that the uh, yeah the, the revolt kind of teed up, uh, as it were, uh, the, the the final showdown in 47, 48, 49. 
Um, and I think this is very important. Um, so I'll, I'll just answer briefly. But basically, the as I mentioned earlier, Arab society, the social fabric on the on the on the Arab side was completely torn. You had just a tremendous amount of bad blood between different families. You had thousands of people killed, as I mentioned. You had thousands more in prison. You had huge waves of uh, refugees. This is another preview of 1948. People who could afford it, uh, Arabs who could afford it, tended to flee the country uh, in their tens of thousands. Um, you had tremendous economic damage on the Arab side. And then, um, and you know, huge numbers of weapons confiscated, and really just Arab, the Arab Arab society was just gutted in every in every conceivable way. And the Jews, despite the tremendous cost in in blood and and to an extent treasure, uh, the Jews really, as I mentioned, came out much much stronger. Militarily, I mentioned. Economically, I, I mentioned. Um, just uh, uh, in terms of settlement, not a single settlement was abandoned during the Arab revolt, but dozens more sprung up around the country. This is the period of uh, wall and tower, Homa uh, in which there was this old Ottoman law that if you put up a structure uh, within 24 hours, it could stay up. And so the Jews made full uh, use of this and uh, dozens of these new strategic settlements sprung up. Uh, and even you know, psychologically, I think in 1939, when the revolt is finally brought to its knees and the world war begins, the Jews of Eretz Israel are, are, are some of the most motivated, united, um, cohesive of any sort of national community in the world, really. And, they, and, and that kind of final showdown between the Jews and the British, but even more importantly, in hindsight, between the Jews and the Arabs, is kind of put on hold because the world war begins, right? Ben Gurion has his famous dictum of we shall fight. How does it go? We shall fight. But what fight, fight the white papers if there's no war and, and right but fight the white papers if there's no Hitler and fight the Hitler Hitlers if there's no white paper. maybe the reverse but the idea is whatever uh, beef we have with the British has to wait there's a higher there's a higher uh, a higher mission right now so it was put on hold and um, of course as those of you who, who know Israeli history uh, will already know about you know about 1944 a Jewish revolt erupts in this country against the British. Once it's clear that the tide of war is turning after Stalingrad, once it looks like Hitler's probably going to lose, uh, certain uh, groups in this country, certain Jewish groups, aim their sights at Britain, and uh, Britain pays dearly for this white paper policy. But that's another talk, perhaps. Uh, but the final showdown in 1947 between Jews and Arabs in this land, particularly the and I'm talking specifically about the civil war, the first phase of the war of independence between the, the Jews of Eretz Israel and the Arabs here. Um, I argue in the book was really won by one side and lost by another nearly 10 years in advance. Um, religion. Religion, yeah. So, so we, we often forget, but Amin al-Husseini was appointed to his uh, elevated and exalted position by none other than Herbert Samuel, the first high commissioner of Palestine Jewish. and, a, and a, not just a Jew, but a, a, a Zionist a, and, and, um, and an active one. He actually, his memo of early 19, I'm writing an article about this now, his memo of early 1915 put, he has this somewhat famous, maybe not famous, but famous among people like me, uh, memo called The Future of Palestine that he wrote in January 1915, which put the whole issue of Zionism on the cabinet table. Um, and so he was intimately involved in every step of the way from through Balfour and, and, and the beginning of the mandate. And he elevated the Mufti to this position. And actually, I'm writing an article about why Dafka he chose the Mufti and rather than several other arguably more qualified candidates. Uh, but he made the Mufti, uh, made Amin Grand Mufti and head of, and created something called the Supreme Muslim, Muslim Council, uh, which the, Amin was also given uh, leadership of by Herbert Samuel. But in terms of how the extent to which religion played a central role in this revolt, you're right that I couldn't find, I, I researched this book for four or five years, I didn't find evidence of even one Christian taking up arms. It's not to say that Christian Arabs didn't support the revolt. Some did, some didn't. I think many did, but not all. Um, I think many Christian Arabs probably would have liked the mandate to continue indefinitely. There was some of the, some of the, um, 
most fascinating uh, material that I found in my research was correspondence between a guy named Yusuf Hanna, who was a Christian Arab, he was the editor of Philistine newspaper in Jaffa, and he was his correspondence with a guy named Joseph Levy, who was a Jewish uh, New York Times correspondent here. Uh, he was Joseph Levy was an Arabic speaking and Hebrew speaking anti Zionist uh, Jew and a, and a journalist, more importantly. And Yusuf Hanna, <laughs> Yusuf Hanna had a line there that I thought was very revelatory, and he said, you know, there's not, a, there's not an Arab in this country worth his salt or a self-respecting Arab who wants to be ruled by Jews. Uh, but there's also not a self-respecting Arab in this country who wants to be ruled by terrorists. And I took that to mean Haj Amin and his henchmen. I think a lot of Christians were worried about what life would be like under uh, you know, Haj Amin's leadership. Um, so, yeah, Christians almost never or even never took up arms in this revolt, although there was a, there was a significant political support from, from, from Christian Arabs. George Antonius, the great intellectual of Arab nationalism and a Christian, is one of the main uh, figures in my, in my book. Um, but in terms of sort of Islam and Islamism and the legacy thereof, I do think the Mufti kind of set the tone in this period that other Palestinian Arab leaders unfortunately felt uh, they had to match. And this is another one of these huge what ifs. What if Herbert Samuel had chosen somebody else for this very exalted, extremely powerful position, which is which is essentially a position for life. Ajamin was named to this position when he was about 25, uh, right? So the, he was, the Herbert Samuel put him there for the next 50 years, let's say. Um, what if someone more than there, there were other prominent Arabs who had a more moderate, uh, sensibility. The, the 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 main rivals to the Husseini camp or the Nashashibis were typically considered uh, more moderate in their relations with the British and with the Jews. Uh, what would have happened had Raghav Nashashibi, for example, uh, been given that instead of and instead of, instead of uh, Amin al Husseini or or many other people? Um, so I do think, in that sense, um, I, the, the 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 Mufti Haj Amin really had a extremely negative legacy, not just for the Israeli side, although that's clear, but 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 for the for the Palestinian side, for the Arab side. There the, this legacy of intransigence, this legacy of self-sabotage even, um, uh, I think was set by him in this uh, period and continued even after World War II. Of course, I probably don't need to tell anyone here that the Mufti famously spent World War II at the side of Hitler uh, in Berlin. Uh, but even after that, he remained uh, he remained the, the the leader, the figurehead, not just the figurehead, but the, the indispensable man of Palestinian Arab nationalism. Sadly, it was only after, uh, as Palestinians see it, the Nakba, the, 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 their defeat and dispersal in 47, 48, 49, that the Palestinians put the Mufti in the dustbin of history. And you don't you don't hear about the Mufti, you know, schools aren't named for the Mufti, there aren't folk songs, named. he's kind of forgotten. It's kind of embarrassed silence as far as the Mufti is concerned. Not because he allied with Hitler, unfortunately, I wish that were why, uh, but because he's a symbol of, of loss and, and defeat um, uh, and extremism, but, but, but yeah, defeat and, uh, and self-sabotage. It's a nice segue to my final question before, we, before I open the floor. Um, this book, I know, is one of the great things about it is it's the first book that's really come out specifically on this topic. And so my question is, for, is it's two part, but uh, why, why do you think this hasn't been covered as it, in, in the depth and detail that you've now done it? And also, um, given what you just said about Palestinian, the way the Palestinian society thinks about the Mufti, how do the Palestinians remember this revolt? Because on the one hand, it was, it was defeat and presumably something they don't um, they don't want to dwell on too much. But also, you know, you mentioned like Kassam is someone that they clearly remember and, you know, <laughs> we, we hear the name every time rockets are fired from Gaza. So um, what's, how is it, why, why is your book the first so far and why, and how is it remembered in Palestinian society, this period? <coughs> so yeah, this, this is the first uh, general interest account of, of the revolt and everything that emanated from it in, in English, surprisingly. This is probably, it's, this has got to be the most written about conflict in the world by far. 
Uh, it's an extremely, you know, the, the, the bookcase of all things Israeli Arab is, is creaking under its own weight. And yet, um, there, there have only been a few very academic studies, uh, some academic articles in English on, on this revolt. You know, it, it tends to get a, a few pages or a chapter in broader histories of the revolt. There's a little bit in Hebrew, there's a little bit in Arabic, but it really hasn't gotten its due. And um, I, in the book, I sort of speculate as to why that is. And I, I kind of wonder aloud whether on the Israeli side, you know, the, the, the sort of Israeli story, the Zionist story is one of self-determination, right? Uh, it's a positive, forward-moving tale of, of self-determination for for a people with, with, without without a land, without self um, without self-determination. And uh, I think, and I kind of speculate that perhaps you know a, a concerted, large-scale uprising by another group of people against that would be maybe it's a kind of a blip in the narrative arc that's that's unwelcome. <laughs> but then I think you know what it still doesn't quite add up because like, this is the Jews have a lot to be proud of in this period. There were, there were tremendous gains made in this period that I've already discussed. Uh, so even that, I'm not, I'm not totally convinced by that <laughs> explanation either. So I don't quite know. But on the Arab side, on the Palestinian side, there's a, I, I quote a, prof uh, there's a professor by the name of Mustafa Kabha, who teaches at the Open University of Israel. He's from the Wadi Ara area. And he's written quite a bit about the revolt, particularly in Arabic, but also in Hebrew and English. And he writes that from a Palestinian perspective, the, the centrality and the primacy of of the Nakba has kind of um, ma marginalized and sidelined everything else. And particularly, not just everything else, but this revolt specifically. And particularly from a Palestinian, from the, from the perspective of Palestinian narrative, it's much easier, quote unquote, to deal with the Nakba, to deal with a perception of being victimized, being victimized by the Jews, being victimized by European imperialism, by their fellow Arabs who didn't rescue them from the Zionist menace as they see it, rather than having to deal with 36 to 39 and all of the Arab infighting that I mentioned earlier. It's much more difficult to explain to yourself as a Palestinian why Arabs were killing Arabs in massive numbers. Um, so that's kind of how I tend to explain it, but uh, it's, it is puzzling. It is puzzling that the, this, this gap has existed and so on. Okay. Um, so what I think we'll do, we'll take a couple of questions from the, from the floor and then I'll see from if, if there's a question on the Zoom as well. So the lady at the back. I have a question. Uh, the massacre of Hebron, what connection did that have to 29 to 36? Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question for those on Zoom who wouldn't have heard it. The question was about the massacre uh, or in, in Hebron in 1929 and the, and the yeah. connection, if there is one, with the... Uh, with the revolt. Yeah. It's a very, very good question. I'm glad you asked me that because so many times when I start telling people about this book, they say, oh, you mean Hebron, 1929? And, and the answer is, uh, is no, actually. Um, it, it, that, of course, appears in my book, but the, the core of my book begins seven years later, as the title suggests. Uh, Hebron was, the, the Hebron massacre of 1929, which was in Hebron and Sfat and a few other places, was uh, a very grim and gruesome um, few days or week of terrorism and riots in which 133 Jews were killed. But I, I believe, and I write in the book, that that's, to my mind, that's all they were. They were riots, they were terrorism, they were not, um, they were not, they did not represent a, a, an uprising, an intifada, as we say nowadays. Uh, it, Again, it was a matter of a few days, whereas the, the period that I'm writing about is, is three years. Intifada shed mamash. So that's, uh, in, in, in that sense, um, that's a distinction that I, that I draw. To, to my mind, 1929, I know there's, there's a book that maybe some of you have read by Professor Hillel Cohen called Year Zero, uh, 1929, uh, Year Zero of the Israeli Arab Conflict. And with all respect to Professor Cohen, I just don't see it as a, as an uprising. I see it as a again a few days of terrorism, um, and yeah, not the, the landscape didn't change all that much before and after 1929 um, in terms of Britain's British policy. Well, Brit Britain contemplated changing policy, but the, it when it decided not to, that's a, that's another story. Uh, whereas I argue that. Before 1936, to before the revolt and after, things changed dramatically uh, in this country, if that makes sense. 
Uh, okay. Um, the, the, yes, the lady here in green. So you opened up your remarks by talking that the um, incipient event was precipitated by jihadi activity in Syria. Is there still jihadi activity? I, I know that there's jihadi activity in Syria going on. Is it still relevant to what's happening here? And also, just beside the point, um, Mayor Soloveitchik in his Jerusalem podcast mentioned that Yasser Arafat was the nephew of the Mufti of Jerusalem, and I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so the question was about, about contemporary jihadi um, uh, Activity in Syria and its pertinence to Israel today. It was, seemed to be the incipient oh, piece of the because there was a jihadi a jihadi activity in Syria mentioned um, by Oren at the beginning, and then the second point was about this uh, about Yasser Arafat being the nephew, allegedly the nephew of um, Hadamin al Hussein. I'll take the the second part first. I I. I don't believe actually that the Mufti that Arafat was related to the Mufti. I think for, if, if memory serves, uh, Arafat kind of inflated or even forged his own sort of family tree, uh, and there's no actual connection there. There, there are scholars who believe that the Husseinis, of, the Husseinis from which Amin al Husseini came, also kind of forged their family tree, and they're not actually Husseinis. There's no connection to the Prophet, but that's another talk. Um, uh, in terms of Syria. Um, in terms of Syria, I think it was, it, you know, this was, it was over a hundred years ago that Qassam came down from Syria. So I think it was a, a fairly different context. He was basically, um, there was a conflict up in Syria between kind of Arab nationalists led by Faisal, the son of the, uh, the leader of Mecca, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the Hashemite family in Mecca which then the French put down and the French decided actually they want Syria and there was this battle that we don't need to get into. And that's how uh, Hassam ended up here, basically. Um, Arab aspirations were dashed in Syria. Um, so I, I don't see a direct line there necessarily, other than the fact that you know this, this particular brand of Islamism that Hassam was preaching is in many ways indistinguishable from a lot of the strands of Islamism that we see today. Okay, I'm going to take a question from the Zoom, and then I'll come back to come back to you guys. Um, so Esther Green asks, um, she says that um, there's a belief among many Jews that the Brits were lenient with or even collaborated with the Arab rebels, as shown in the book Revolt by Leave by Horace Samuel. Um, is that something you're familiar with? Do you agree with that premise? Um, I, I haven't read the book that she that she mentions, uh, but from all of my research, I, I, there's a section of the book in which I get to that question, which I think a lot of us Israelis always want to know, which is who, who did the Brits like more, right? Uh, and um, <laughs> and who did they admire more? And I and I, the kind of conclusion that I reach is that the British admired the, this is of course a generalization, but on the whole, the average Britain who's posted here tended to admire the Jews more, but like the Arabs more. Uh, and um, and uh, yeah, so, but in terms of, they, they, they got along better with the Arabs, but they had a sort of grudging admiration for the accomplishments of the Jews, which were just undeniable when, when you look at how, swiftly this, this land transformed over throughout the 20s and 30s um, and what the Jews were able to accomplish. So in terms of out and out collaboration between the Brit, between the British and the Arabs, Arab gangs, Arab uh, gunmen, terrorists, I didn't, I didn't find any in this period. Uh, the British were, were, you know, they viewed, they viewed the, the, these Arab gangs as, as the enemy. Uh, there was a certain, sometimes a certain feeling of, okay, this is good, clean fun. You know, they shoot at us, we shoot at them. Uh, but uh, which, which, by the way, changed when, when the Jews rose up in a revolt, there was a, a very different feeling among many, many British, which was that the Jews aren't playing fair. The Jews are, the Jews are, uh, you know, the Arabs played fair when they, you know, quote unquote, when it was a, a fair fight when they rose up against us, but the Jews are really. Um, so no, I, I have to say, I didn't, I, you know, politically, we can certainly talk about, as, as I did earlier, about appeasement and about whether 
the British went back on their promises in the Balfour Declaration. I think there's a lot to talk about there. But in terms of out and out collaboration with Arab gangs, I didn't, I didn't find anything. Okay, thanks. Yes, gentlemen in the cap. Yes, um, about the what if questions. Did there have not been this revolt? Did the Jews uh, really choose the uh, nation state option? Which was not very clear before in the Zionist movement if uh, we wanted kind of autonomy under the Arab or Brits. Mm -hmm. That's the question. Okay, so the the question is is whether the uh, in a sort of what if question if this revolt hadn't happened would the Jews still have been committed in the same way as they were eventually to the to the nation state option rather than the, the more nebulous ideas of a, of a national home or some kind of autonomy. So one one of the biggest differences between Jabotinsky and the and the Ben Gurion movement was that Jabotinsky spoke openly, even from from the twenties if not before about a Jewish state, and he said. He would basically say, listen, this is the goal of all of us Zionists. It's just I have the courage and the honesty to tell you, to tell you that. You know, but Weizmann and Ben-Gurion, they, they want the same thing. They're just not speaking about it openly. Um, and, you know, I, I think we're at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center. I think we should probably talk about Begin in this period a little bit. Um, Begin was a young guy. He was about 25 in this period. He was not in Palestine, in Israel. He was, of course, a Beitar leader in Poland. But there was, uh, some of you may know about this famous kind of showdown that the young, excuse me, Begin had there uh, with uh, Jabotinsky in 1938. There was a Beitar conference in Warsaw. And um, this was the period of Munich, uh, the, 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 the great, Ch Chamberlain's great appeasement at Munich. Uh, this was um, after the Peel Partition Plan, which Begin very much opposed. And um, Jabotinsky gets up and he's talking about the conscience of the world. And he's talking about, uh, you know, people like Weizmann and Ben-Gurion thought that Jabotinsky was an extremist, but uh, Jabotinsky gets up and he's talking in fairly moderate terms and basically saying, trust, I'm, widely, I'm, I'm very loosely paraphrasing here, but he's saying basically trust the British, trust the, the conscience of the world, even in, even in mid 1938. And, uh, and Begin gets up and gives a very brazen, heartfelt speech, uh, basically, saying that, basically saying that we need to, uh, if not revolt against the British, the, 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 entire, the entire focus of Begin's remarks were, was, on, was on arms. He wanted to, in fact, change the oath of Beitar from saying, uh, I promise to, I pledge to defend the homeland, to saying, I pledge to defend uh, I, I pledged my people's defense and to conquer the homeland. And it was actually Ben Gurion who carried the day. They changed, they changed the uh, the oath. But Jabotinsky, Begin. sorry, Begin. Be Begin carried the day, correct? Uh, but Jabotinsky famously dismissed Begin <coughs> and compared his remarks to Rash, creaking of a door. the creaking of a door. Uh, and uh, reportedly, this brought Begin to tears. This rebuke from his his idol. Jabotinsky. Um, but it's really fascinating that, you know, Jabotinsky, this man who was seen by the British and by, by, by Ben Gurion and Weizmann as really quite an extremist, that in this particular period, in mid 1938, he's talking about conscience, he's talking about uh, moderation. And he even says to Begin at a certain point, if you don't believe in conscience anymore, you have two options you can jump into the Visla River or you can become a communist. <laughs> and uh, it's a pretty it's 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 a pretty grim thing to say when you think about all the horrors of of, of the Holocaust and everything that came after. But um, within two years, Jabotinsky was dead, and um, and uh, in 1944, Begin arrives in Palestine and very soon becomes the leader of the Irgun. But that yet again is another <laughs> a talk for another day. Okay. Uh, yes, just if someone said to you, your book is too pro-Israeli, how would you respond? Question is, if someone said that your book is too pro-Israeli, how would you respond? I've been extremely pleased and pleasantly surprised that I jumped into this minefield and yet have gotten very, a little bit, but very little in way of negative feedback. I've gotten 
one, I think I have one negative uh, written review on Amazon. Not, not everyone's going to go check it out. Uh, <laughs> from a very pro-Palestinian person. And there was one um, very right-wing Israeli guy who thought I was, you know, too, I was too, I went too easy on the Palestinians. Um, but really, other than that, I mean, who knows what people are saying behind closed doors, but I've, I've really been very pleased that I was able to get I was able to get endorsements from both Israeli, Israelis and, and, and indeed some, some Palestinians as well. I was able to get endorsements from right-wing Israelis, left-wing Israelis, and I think that's not a sure sign that it's a, you know, a great book, but it's a, it's a, nice, it's a nice start. Uh, that to the, the, I, I'd like to think that this is a balanced book. We all have our biases, of course. I'm, I'm a dual citizen of the U.S. and Israel. I'm not Palestinian. Um, but I, I really tried in this book. It's not a polemical book. I'm not trying to make or win arguments. I'm trying to write a really, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a journalist and a, and a researcher and a, and a writer, and I, I tried to write something that was going to be really engaging and a page turner and really deeply researched, uh, but, but something that would let all sides have their say and make their best case and let the reader draw his or her conclusions. That's, in that sense, I wanted it to be a kind of old school work of, of history. Um, so, you know, people will say what, what they will say, but uh, so far I've been, I've, been, I've been pleased. I'd say these days in particular, if you're getting positive reviews from both left wing and right wing is ready to do something quite fast. <laughs> um, okay. Um, yes. Definitely. Earlier we discussed the legal authority that the British use for the counterinsurgency. Mm -hmm. What citizenship status or, or status did the Arabs have, did, did the Jews have at the time? The British had to apply the law. Okay, that's a great question. So the question is about the the, the, uh, the reference, there was a reference earlier to the, the, to the um, legal, uh, to, to the um, legality of British, of British actions against the Arabs and the Jews. And the question is what citizenship status did the Jews and Arabs have according to British law at the time? Um, so basically it was, it wasn't quite, um, Palestine wasn't exactly a, a, a colony. It was a, it was a League of Nations mandate, right? So at least in principle, Britain was administering this land on behalf of the international community, uh, of the time, the League of Nations. And, uh, it's often forgotten, but it was, you know, the, the U S actually wasn't a member of the League of Nations, but the U S, uh, gave its, uh, assent privately to the Balfour Declaration and gave its assent when the, when the League of Nations gave the mandate to Britain, the country that had delivered the Balfour Declaration, it had the League of Nations imprimatur on it. So it's not just Britain. You often hear from Palestinians that you know, Britain gave away a country that it didn't have the right to give away. It was the, it was, you know, you'd have to take that up with Britain, France, Italy, and the US, even though it wasn't a member of the League of Nations. Um, so, so they weren't British, subjects, they were citizens of Palestine, both Jews and Arabs. Of course, many Jews also had dual citizenship um, with other countries, Poland, Russia, and Germany. Um, but um, but yeah, so that's in terms of the legal status. And then the second part of the question was? was the Arabs. The, the legal authority that the British used. Yeah, yeah. Did they then have to use it with a mandate? British law to allow them to do uh, that? Right, very good question. So it was, it was in that sense, it was kind of a strange hybrid because they were operating on behalf of the League of Nations, League of Nations but really ultimate power rested in London, particularly with the colonial office. Um, so in that sense, it was really de facto administered as a colony, but every year they would have to go back to Geneva and kind of uh, plead their case and, and show the League of Nations that they were operating within the, within the boundaries of the mandate. And indeed, when the white paper was passed, uh, the League of Nations, had the World War not begun, it's very likely that the League of Nations wouldn't have, would have rejected it. There was a, the League of Nations Mandates Commission actually initially rejected the white paper as being outside the bounds of the mandate, basically saying, you guys are reneging on your purpose there, which is um, facilitating the Jewish national home. Yeah, if that makes sense. So it was, it was, again, it was a weird hybrid where they're operating on behalf of the international community, quote unquote, but really answerable to London more than it is. Okay, questions. I was curious, um, having not read the book, how do you 
coalesce the Palestinian identity that we now know, the Palestinian nationalism. When you mentioned, you spent so much time discussing the infight mm. and the, uh, the breakdown of any coalescence there for them to even counter the British, who were certainly more, uh, more in, li in line with them with their interest with the oil. So where does the Palestinian nation state come from and how do you address it during that period, even, uh, even uh, if it did not contribute okay. to what we see today? So, okay, so the question is, given the, given the, the infighting, the Arab infighting that was going on at the time, um, how, do, how, do, how does uh, Oren think about the, the question of Palestinian national identity? And was uh, the revolt key? To the Palestinian and, nations. And was the revolt key to, to passing nationalism? Yeah, it's a good question. And I and I do believe and write in the book, uh, it's one of the themes of the book that this was a really formative event in terms of the formation of a distinct Palestinian Arab identity. I think it's I think it's a fair reading of history, you know, even sometimes uh you know, I think it's a fair reading of history that had the Jews never arrived here in large numbers, that this land would simply be part of a greater Syria. I think that's probably true. Um, I think it's fair to say that Palestinian nationalism developed as a mirror image in response to Zionism. Uh, I think that's I think that's probably correct. Um, uh, children who were born in the twenties and thirties, given identity papers okay. yeah it would have said it would have, whether they were jewish or arab it would have said palestine so and this is this is not in terms of you know terminology is always a, a minefield and in, in the book i really i try not to use anything anachronistic so here talking to you guys in 2023 i may say palestinians and you guys know that i mean palestinian arabs but in this period the word palestinian on its own didn't signify one or the other Right. When Weizmann, who was based in London, talked about Ben Gurion, he talked about and Ben Gurion company. He talked about the Palestinians, Palestinian Jews. Right. The word Palestinian, the, the phrase Palestinian Jew appears again and again in the, in the archival record among the British, among the Jews themselves. Uh, so at the time, so in the book, I almost always call the Arabs of this land Palestinian Arabs or the Arabs of Palestine. It's more of a mouthful, but um, it's 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 true to the time. It's how they were called at the time. Just like the Jews were called the Jews of Palestine in English, anyway. In Hebrew, you know, Yehudei Eretz Yisrael, Hayishul, different terminology. But the Jews also, in this period, when talking about this land in English, they talk about they talk about Palestine, and that's that's why uh, I use the P word in the title, which you know, even though today it can be uh, somewhat controversial or even triggering for some people, in 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 the period that's that's that was the name of this land in English. That, that was uh, used by almost everybody. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. What was the infighting about? And did the Arabs here have a strategy, a military strategy, uh, leaders apart from mm -hmm. the Okay, was it, what, was the what was the Arab infighting about? And did, was there a military strategy and leaders other than uh, Hajjami al -Sain? So really, that the the initial unity that I talked about in the kind of first phase of the revolt, the first six months of the revolt before the leading up to the Peel Commission, as mentioned, that unity really dissolved or, or exploded in the, in the second phase. And really, um, you know, there were different there were rival families in Arab society before the revolt, during the revolt, after the revolt, and um, once that kind of initial unity or a facade of unity started to, to erode, uh, I think a lot of people use the revolt as a screen for score for settling other scores. Um, and then blood feuds began and once blood is shed, it needs to be answered. And um, so yeah, I think in many ways it was used as a, as a screen to settle scores that may have gone back years or decades or um, and you know and those those rivalries that I that I mentioned, Chief among them was the Hussein Nashashidi rivalry. And each of those families had their allied families. There were five or six great Jerusalem Arab families, and each of them tended to be aligned with either the Husseinis or the Nashashidis. Um, and so, yeah, so really it was oftentimes used, the revolt, taking up of arms was used in many ways as a pretext for settling all kinds of unrelated scores, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
<laughs> but in terms of other leaders, yeah, there were militant leaders. There were, and unlike the unlike the Mufti who I mentioned is kind of conveniently forgotten by in Palestinian narrative, these militant leaders, they, you know, there's still schools named after them. They still, their names still live on in a kind of hazy way in the Palestinian pantheon. Um, I mentioned that uh, it's kind of difficult from a Palestinian perspective to sort of explain to yourself why so many Arabs were killing Arabs, but in a sort of a hazier way, the, the figures and the symbols of the revolt, you know, certain folk songs still still live on. So this is, um, yeah, you still so you still hear some of these folk songs today, for example. Um, so yeah, this is kind of one of the central themes of the book is that for for Israelis as much as for, for Palestinians as much as for Israelis, this this revolt uh, really rages on even today. Mm -hmm. Good place to end it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So a round of applause, please, for our guest then. Uh, the, uh, the, book, the book is on sale outside. Oren will be signing uh, signing copies um, as you purchase them. For those of you on Zoom, uh, if you missed the, the Amazon link, just go to Amazon, uh, put in Oren Kessler's name, the book Palestine 1936, and you'll find it. Um, my name is Paul Gross. Again, if you're not, if you want to be on our mailing list for English events and you're not, drop me an email, paulg at bagancenter.org.il. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.